Let's go ahead and, and get started. Uh, the title of this presentation is Data Modeling Solution Solutions for Challenging Data Model Problems. And this is primarily focused on Power BI, but this also applies to uh, SQL Server Analysis Services tabular models. Uh, Power BI is actually built on top of the Analysis Services tabular engine, uh, what is internally called the VertiPack engine. Uh, it was part of a uh, an internal project at Microsoft some seven or eight years ago called Project Gemini. And it is a, an in-memory uh, uh, column store uh, tabular data modeling technology that essentially takes data, places it all in memory, compresses each column and every table, defines relationships, and and that is the, the modeling engine that Power BI uses, Power Pivot in Excel, and analysis services tabular and then there, we have flavors of analysis services uh, both in azure and, and on-prem so that's what we're going to be talking about today so my examples will all be using power bi uh, i am a lead consultant uh, we, we just uh, renamed all of our roles at, at uh, pragmatic works uh, formerly uh, I, I was a, a principal consultant a lead consultant too at uh, pragmatic works uh, I've been with Pragmatic Works uh, full time for about two years, but I've uh, worked with Pragmatic Works for many, many years. Great, great organization for both training and and consulting in the Microsoft Data Platform, Azure, and Business Intelligence space. Uh, a member of the Microsoft Data Platform uh, MVP program, but the MVP program is a Data Platform MVP. And uh, you are welcome to subscribe to my blog. This is my personal blog at SQL Server BI. Dot blog. Uh, we also maintain a, a very active blog and um, and host uh, free content at Pragmatic Works as well as uh, subscription-based training. Um, I will mention that uh, if if you've been affected by the the COVID outbreak, uh, if you've been furloughed, if you are a job seeker because of uh, you know companies that have been struggling with the outbreak, um, Pragmatic Works is actually offering um, free training for those individuals. So reach out to us through through our website. And uh, I tweet it uh, at Paul underscore Turley. And so you're welcome to, to follow me and connect with me. I'm also on LinkedIn. I just didn't list all that, my contact information. So uh, this is essentially um, uh, how I described this session. And we're going to jump right in and talk about um, different modeling techniques. Now, there are a number of business intelligence products in the industry. Um, five, six years ago, we really saw a, a, a surge in self-service BI, meaning rather than business intelligence, reporting, analytics, and decision support tools, being part of IT, the traditional approach where uh, the business needs reports, the business needs dashboards, they need to interact with and, and analyze and learn from data. So they go to IT, they dictate business requirements to maybe a business systems analyst, developers then build uh, an ETL process to populate a data warehouse, they build a semantic model, they build reports and visualizations, dashboards on, on top of that. A lot of those tools now are in the hands of business users uh, through tools like, like Tableau and ClickView and, and, uh, and Spotfire and, and uh, there are a number of tools that have become very, very popular in the industry. Pros and cons there. Um, one, uh, you know, importing some data and, and throwing it into a chart, easy thing to do with a variety of tools, including Power BI, including uh, charting inside of Excel with Power Query and Power Pivot. Um, but most of those tools promote the idea of importing data, maybe mashing it together into a single table. And in, in the view of the casual data consumer, the world is flat because they primarily use tools like Excel. And in the world of Excel, generally what we do is we bring data together into a flat table. So we look at this example, this is real data um, from a sample database that I'm going to be using. But if, if I were an Excel uh, user, I would most likely bring that into 
a worksheet, perhaps a table within a worksheet. Let's analyze this a little bit. You can see that there are three separate date columns that uh, describe uh, retail orders, the, the date that the, the order was placed, the date that it's due, the delivery date. This is you know, very, very common sample data that we've seen in, in a number of databases. Um, then we have some customer information. So here we have the customer name, we have the customer key. I've simplified this. We might have other attributes like the name, the address, the zip code, the you know, country, et cetera. Um, we have some, um, some product information. And again, in the simplified view, we've got the category, subcategory, and product name. And then we have some numeric columns. And, and we'll call those um, uh, measure columns, numeric columns that can be aggregated, whether they're summed or averaged, min, max, you know, uh, uh, whatever we do with those numbers, that's what we're analyzing. And we generally are going to filter, we're going to group, and then we're going to aggregate these numeric columns. That's the world of, of flat spreadsheet-based reporting, which has its place in the world. And uh, it's a very simple approach. Um, however, when you're dealing with a large volume of data, and you're working with more complex data structures, this does not meet all of those business needs. So let's move on to the next view, and that is the dimensional model. So if, if you're new to business intelligence a la Microsoft, um, then the, the dimensional model is, is, is really kind of data modeling 101. This is the thing that you need to master and understand and understand where to use it, where to perhaps make exceptions um, in your data modeling journey. So we, we have the concept that we call a star schema. Now, this is not a new concept. This has been around for a very long time. The idea behind a star schema is that we define business facts. We'll talk about that process. And then those facts are, are, are grouped by, filtered by, related to, dimensions. Uh, so here, here is a materialized um, star schema in the sample database that I'm going to show you. Now I have a, a few different fact tables, but those facts could be things like online sales and uh, store sales. Um, they, they, they could be um, transactions, they could, or at least the summarized view of transactions. It could be a lot of things, but there are always numbers associated with facts. And generally we have keys that allow us then to relate those facts um, to individual dimensions. And these are four different dimension tables, customer, product, order date, and store in this very simple example. So, um, Using a dimensional model is, is a general best practice. And what I mean by that is that 95% of the time, this is going to be the go-to modeling approach for analytic data, for business intelligence data. Now, the dimensional model doesn't necessarily meet all of the needs, but it is a starting point, and it really should be the place where you start when you're creating an analytic solution, meaning generally we're summarizing and aggregating across these different dimensions. Um, you get improved performance, accurate results, and um, but it's not an absolute for simple attributes. What I mean by that is that we might have attributes associated with a fact. So let's say that an order could be um, active, inactive, or unknown. So on every one of my order records, I have active, inactive, or unknown. Do I need to put that into a dimension table so that I can completely adhere to the, the rules and the concepts of dimensional modeling? No, there are exceptions, and the, the tabular modeling engine uh, has a place for those exceptions. So you don't always have to pound everything into the shape of a star. So there are rare exceptions, but they really should be treated as exceptions. So where did these dimensional modeling rules come from? Who defined them? Where can you, you find them? If you've been around the industry, you know that the, the go-to group, the go-to people who uh, ha have really fleshed all of this out and have written a, a number of, of great books on the topic are this group of people. Not to be confused with this group of people, though the family photo might look very similar. 
All right, so this is the Kimball Group, and the, the gentleman uh, in the center uh, below is Ralph Kimball. Um, over the course of about 30 years, Ralph Kimball and his consulting group, the Kimball Group, have written numerous books on the, uh, on the topic of, of, I'm looking for my copy of the Data Warehouse Toolkit. It's not right behind me, so I, yeah, oh, there it is. So here's the, the, uh, the Data Warehouse Toolkit. There are several editions of the Data Warehouse Toolkit. And if you're new to data modeling, I would strongly, strongly um, suggest that you pick up a copy of this book, get an online copy, or you can go to the Kimball Group website where a lot of this information is shared. Now, I'm gonna walk you through the process very, very quickly. Um, there are a lot of good resources for dimensional modeling uh, available um, through different organizations. Uh, we, we teach a course on dimensional modeling. Uh, we talk about uh, applying dimensional modeling to SQL Server, to Power BI, to analysis services. But the process is very, very simple according to uh, the, the, the uh, religion of Kimball. You select business processes, whiteboard that, talk about it, make sure you understand at a high level all of your business processes. You declare the grain of your data across those processes. If we're managing orders, what's the, the grain of an order? Is it at a date? Is it at, at a time? Is it at a week? Is it at a month? Is it at a geography? Is it at a store? Is it an online sale, et cetera? Across all of those dimensional concepts, what is the lowest level of grain that we care about? And keep in mind that the, the higher level of grain means less rows in tables, less work for the modeling engine, faster performance. So there's always this trade-off between details and summary, and it's all measured in levels of grain across each of your dimensions. Identify the dimensions, identify the facts. So four steps, very simple. Once you get into the weeds, it gets a little more complex and you have more work to do. Load the detailed uh, atomic data. This has to do with the level of grain again. Um, into your dimensional structures. Uh, you build your dimensional models. Now remember that that, that the, the 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 religion of Ralph Kimball uh, is you know 20, 25 years old, um, but is as true as it ever was. The reason that this is important and related to Power BI and analysis services is that the product teams at Microsoft generally have built their products on top of these principles even though these, the, the, the uh, Kimball Group actually retired five years ago, but uh, they left a very, very strong legacy. Uh, number three, um, ensure that, that the fact table has an associated date dimension table. This is a very important concept that I'm going to, to show you. Um, ensure that all facts in the single table are at the same grain. I'm gonna go ahead and, and just kind of finish out the list here. We talk about um, different types of relationships, cardinality. Uh, are there any many-to-many -many relationships? So um, a doctor can practice at multiple facilities. And so if we need to model that data, we've got to figure out how to assign a doctor to multiple facilities, clinics and hospitals, since a doctor does not have a one-to-one -one relationship or a one-to-many or a one-to-many relationship. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, and then make sure that um, anything that you need to group by, filter by, uh, or relate between these different tables uh, has a, a column represented in the dimension tables and in the fact tables. And then we're always going to be evolving this. And uh, in the business intelligence world, that's an important thing to understand, is that PI projects never end. They're always being adjusted. They're always going to be evolving. So you need to use an iterative approach, a phased approach, but not a waterfall. You don't get all of the requirements up front, spend all of your time doing that, do all of your ETL work, all of your modeling work, all of your reporting work. It needs to be iterative. All right, so let's get into the weeds and, and, uh, and talk about building a data model, and then I'm going to show you some examples. So an important concept is the idea of, of role-playing dimensions. And I'm going to pause just for a second and look over our questions real quick. Um, I see um, Todd, DBATM restricts access to um, source tables. 
they create semantic views. These views um, appear to have a SCAR model. Um, I'm going to go back and Todd, I'm going to, to address that as we talk about working with data sources. And uh, at, at the end, we'll talk about uh, sharing the deck and, and where you can go for resources. Okay, role playing dimensions. <clears throat> so, in this very simple example, I have um, uh, on time flight information from the FAA. The concept of an airport uh, can play two different roles in this scenario. Airplanes leave from an airport, they arrive at an airport. As far as flights are concerned, um, a, a flight leaving from an airport, that, that the airport in that, in that scenario only plays one role. That is the departure airport as opposed to the arrival airport. I only have one physical airport table. But in my semantic model, in order to say, I want to be able to select the region of any airports where flights are leaving from, I don't know how many flights there were, how many different kinds of flights there were at a different time of the day, those are my departure uh, airports. And so in, in this scenario, I would have two separate tables materialized in my semantic model based on the same base airport table. Um, same could be true of dates. Now in Power BI, if I have one date table, that has multiple um, keys in a fact table like sales, Power BI is going to automatically create one active and then multiple inactive relationships for each of those foreign keys in the fact table. And we'll talk about active and inactive relationships. To be able to create a role playing dimension for each of the uh, date foreign keys in my sales table, order date, due date, delivery date, I would create three separate instances of my date tables. So that's really the concept of a role-playing dimension. And in Power BI, it essentially means that I'm going to go create a copy of, of a, a single table within the semantic model. It gives use up memory, um, but it gives us the ability to filter and group on those tables as they play those different roles. All right, and I'll show you an example of that. Bidirectional filters, this is an important concept. Bidirectional filters give us the ability to filter records in either direction. I'm gonna um, pop over to a, an example and uh, sh show you an example of a bidirectional filter. The data model that I'm going to show you is, uh, it's a model that I've actually published um, uh, publicly that you're able to get to. If you go to my blog, this is the COVID-19 uh, Power BI report that uh, I've been, been uh, kind of working on over the past month or so. This has current data uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, the data is gathered from the um, CDC and the WHO, so the World Health Organization and the uh, US Centers for Disease Control. And this data is actually updated every day and has current statistics, or at least within 24 hours. Um, current statistics, um, you can see that in this desktop version, I'm a few days old because uh, the numbers are a, a bit low. But um, I wanted to show you within the data model, I am storing case data at a county and or state and or country level. And uh, that's the way that the data is coming to us in, uh, in some regions is at the country level. So for example, in, in Europe, we only have data at country level. Um, in um, uh, Canada and uh, Australia, for example, we have data at a state or province level. And then the United States, we have data at a county level. Because of that mixed grain, what I needed to do is create a bridging table at that level of grain. It's actually at the... Uh, uh, in this version of the model, it's, it's I was going to say county, but uh, it's at the state level. And, um, but I do need to relate that regional information to world populations only at the country level. So the way that I do that is I build a dimension table at the state country level, which is called country state. I also have a, 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 a table that, that is really just a distinct list of countries to bridge this to my population data. So these are world populations. Well, in, 
in, in order to select a country and to see populations and COVID cases, I have to be able to filter in both directions. So you can see that this is a one-to-one. -one. So in the population by country table, I have one record per country that relates to my country reference table. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship with a bi-directional filter. Um, and then from country, I need to be able to filter states by country and then um, states to case details. For our purposes, let's say that we're at a state level. And so this has to be a bi-directional filter. What that means is that if I select a country, I need to propagate that selection, that filter to this table, and then propagate the filter down to the case details. You can see here in this one to many relationship that is a single direction filter that's kind of out of the box. That's the thing that you get when you build a relationship but I needed to change this relationship to bi-directional. Now, uh, I remember uh, three or four years ago attending a, a session at the PASS Summit uh, that Alberto Ferrari was giving, and uh, Alberto was trying to make the point that bi-directional filters were very costly. And uh, I, I remember um, him, and I, I, love, I love to quote Alberto, um, I remember that he said, if uh, you use a bi-directional filter, you will go to hell. And he, he was making the point that it's, uh, it, it's, it's not always a good thing and um, there is a performance cost, uh, but sometimes it's necessary. So check your, check your salvation at the door when you use bi-directional filters. And uh, yes, you can get inconsistent results if, if your, your data is not modeled correctly. So you need to be very, very careful with bi-directional filters. To the comment of, of inconsistent results, let's think about that. So if I am uh, reporting at a state level, which is what my, my case details are stored at for a lot of regions, if I select a country, I'm going to get population for a country and then I'm going to com be comparing that to a state, which means I would get that population repeated for, for every state. So that's an example of where I might get inconsistent results. All right, back to PowerPoint for now. So those are bi-directional filters. Oh, look, I'm showing you a screenshot of exactly what I was talking about. All right, many-to-many -many relationships. I'm just gonna talk through the concept of many-to-many -many relationships very quickly. It can be a complicated topic, um, and there are a couple of different approaches. If I have a, because I was supposed to build that slide, if I have a two tables who have an inferred many-to-many -many relationship, I may have to build a bridge table to associate those two tables together. Now, earlier I was using the example of doctors and facilities. In my mind, this is, this is a, a, a very easy concept to understand. A doctor can practice at multiple clinics. Uh, he or she could practice at uh, multiple hospitals. And so in order to assign a doctor to multiple facilities, and to be able to say at this facility there could be multiple doctors, I would have to have a bridging table if correctly modeled. Now, Power BI actually gives me the ability to go grab a key column and drag it into another table where we don't have um, a, a, a distinct set of keys, meaning that uh, we could have multiple doctors over here, multiple facilities over here. Um, and, and if I, uh, let, let's say that at the facility, I have, yeah, this is a horrible example. Uh, my screen just went black. Okay, I don't know if, if you all experienced that, but my uh, display went black while I was presenting here. Anyway, Power BI gives me the ability to, to actually infer a many-to-many -many relationship, but it's not a feature that's recommended. It's not a feature that I use. I would build a bridge table. And uh, just going back to, let's see what happened. PowerPoint is still open. But if I wanted to select, let's say, an account, and I want to see the customers associated with that account, this relationship is not going to work, this one right here, because the natural filtering direction of a relationship 
is in the opposite direction that I need it for. So if I were to select an account, I'm not going to see the customers associated with that account unless I make it a bidirectional filter like this. Okay, so in this case, it's customer to account. I'm going to select a customer. I want to see the associated accounts. That has to be a bidirectional filter so the filter can flow in this direction. All right, so who needs relationships anyway? So I'm going to walk you through some demonstrations and show you where we can do some advanced modeling techniques um, by um, kind of adding layers on top of a star schema model. We're going to start by talking about disconnected tables. Uh, then we'll talk about driving dynamic calculations using a disconnected table uh, in concert with the DAX switch function and the selected value function. And then we're going to get into the weeds with um, some business applications of these concepts. I get my slides to advance. All right, let me uh, just look over questions here real quick before we jump into this. All right, thank you for your, your comment about bidirectional filters, Rosemary. Uh, I believe that this session is being recorded. I'm not quite sure what the logistics are for playback. Um, Crystal, if you're there, uh, feel free to comment on that. And I believe that they're just available on our website. Um, Uh, Ricardo, there, there are a number of techniques that you can use to avoid using bidirectional filters, and uh, it would kind of require us to get into the weeds, but you're right, it's not always necessary. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you build a bridge table in, uh, in Power BI? What if the source model cannot be changed? Um, you can build your bridge table in, in Power BI. So you can, uh, you, you can create a derived table in Power Query and uh, using a, a merge and then uh, materialize that as your bridge table um, in your, your data model. Um, and you can also do it in DAX. I would generally do what you can in, in Power Query. So let's just review that very quickly. If, if I need to derive a table, so I have the components of that table through, through joins and merges, I, I could derive a bridge table that I need. Um, where can I do that? A, you could create a, a view within your relational database. If you don't have permission to do that, uh, you know, you can go to your DBA, ask them to create a view, and then you can materialize that just by importing it. If you don't have the ability to do that, you can use Power Query to merge two tables together and materialize that merge table as a table in your data model. And you actually have the ability to do that in DAX as well. And I, I generally would not use, use the DAX option. I would generally use Power Query to do that. All right, what's the, uh, what's the deciding factor to use analysis services over Power BI for tabular model? Oh my gosh, that could be a very deep discussion. Um, analysis services um, supports uh, things like source control and um, uh, large models. However, Power BI in premium capacity also supports very, very large models. Without getting into the weeds in that discussion, because there are a lot of deciding points and it's also um, products and technologies that are rapidly change, changing, I'll say this. Power BI is the product that Microsoft is paying most attention to. Um, they, they've essentially moved uh, those product teams from the SQL Server product group into the Power BI group, which means that analysis services, both Azure Analysis Services and Analysis Services on-prem will continue to be supported and we'll see new versions. However, Power BI is getting all the love. In the past, Power BI has been the lighter weight self-service tool. However, now with premium capacity, the uh, XMLA endpoint, um, uh, uh, incremental refresh features, Power BI is quickly becoming the go-to tool for data modeling and where to build your data sets. Now we're going to have interoperability between analysis services and Power BI. And the XMLA endpoint is kind of the, the 
critical feature or capability that uh, and I don't have time to get into that, but uh, uh, check that out and, and understand it. I'll be blogging and doing some some uh, video posts on using the XMLA endpoint, migrating models, migrating models between analysis services and SSAS tabular, uh, et cetera. Okay, I see some very long questions and uh, we'll try to get to them at the end. All right, let's just jump into some demonstrations. So, um, where do we use disconnected tables? Now, I'm going to jump over to this Power BI file. All right, my objective is to create a dynamic measure that allows me to be able to choose a, a time series period and then to be able to um, visualize the uh, to be able to visualize a, 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 a different version of a time series in a single visual. Let me show you the outcome first. So I'm going to go find my dynamic time series right here. All right. I'm going to just, just deselect everything in this slicer. And let's see, sales time series. Let's go back and, and that's not the one I wanted. Yeah, we'll go ahead and um, I'm going to change this visual. And let's take, hope I'm doing this right. To take period off of columns. Yes, okay. So I have already in my data model created a number of time series measures. Now I, we're, we're measuring online sales. So I have my online sales quantity and we'll look at the uh, measure right up here. You can see that that's just simply the sum of the quantity column in the online sales fact table. Now, um, I have also created a number of time series versions of that measure. So for example, in the month to date measure, excuse me, I've used the total month to date function here against my online sales quantity measure. I have to use my date table in order to get the total month to date. And that's exactly what I've done here. So in my matrix visual, I have my date hierarchy. Here you can see the individual dates. And so um, here you're just seeing the online sales quantity. Now, if I were to um, add my month to date, you would see that that accumulates. So the numbers just get bigger over the course of a month. When we get to the end of the month, you should see that, that the numbers start over again and continue to accumulate. Well, that's great. I can drag my you know, prior year, my year to date, my um, uh, uh, same period last year, all of these different time series measures that I've created into this matrix and create individual columns. But what I want to do is I want to be able to dynamically select a period and then I want this measure to change accordingly. So let's go ahead and take that off. And I've created a dynamic measure that does this and it's driven by a disconnected table called selected measure period. To show you that part of the expression here, you can see that I'm using the selected value function to say, all right, which period did the user select? Which periods currently has filter context? If a single period has been selected from that table, then get that value. And if it's current, then return this measure value. If it's month to date, return this measure value, et cetera. Let's go take a look at the data model. And you can see that that is just a table floating out there all by itself. It's not related to anything. So this is an exception to 
the, the typical relationships that I would create in a model. How did I create that table? I actually just typed in the values. I used the enter data feature to create the table. And if we look at the periods, I just keyed in current month to date, year to date, same period last year, prior year, and fiscal month to date. Those are just values that I want to appear in a slicer or in a group so that I can use this measure. So if I choose current, I'm, that's going to return the online sales quantity. If I choose month to date, then that's going to return my month to date or my prior year or my same period last year or my year to date or my fiscal month to date. Now, because I've placed this into a, um, a matrix, I can also place this period column into the columns group. And now if I select, I'm holding down control, if I select multiple periods, that's going to generate multiple columns. All right, so that's that's how we can use disconnected tables. I'm going to show you um, a more advanced uh, example of a disconnected table. I would like to see the orders that um, are due for delivery that have not yet been delivered. And I, I want to be able to do that in a range of dates. So let me give you just a little more space here. I know that's kind of hard to see. So from July 24th to October 7th, I have 987 orders that are pending delivery, meaning that the order date is uh, on or before 724, but the um, the delivery date is um, is uh, on or after, I believe after October 7th. So how does that work? Let's go ahead and just tease this apart a bit. So if we look at this column visual, you can see that I'm, I'm using a measure called online pending delivery. I'm also using a disconnected table on the x-axis called select effective date. Well, let's just go back to our model. You can see that there's select effective date. If we go and look at that table, you can see that it's just a list of dates. Essentially what I did in Power Query, I um, referenced my date dimension table. I only kept the date column and then I materialized this into the model. It really was that simple. Let's go back to the visual and take a look at the online orders pending delivery. So utilizing that disconnected table, I'm going to reclaim a little bit of horizontal space so that I can zoom in on this DAX here in the editor and just point out what we're doing here. So the first thing I'm doing is, is I'm declaring a variable. This is just for convenience sake. It makes my, my DAX code a little easier to read. The first thing that I need to do is figure out if I have, um, here we're always assuming that we have a single effective date selected. Um, since I've placed the effective date, uh, the, the date column from the select effective date table onto the x-axis of that um, column chart, there's always going to be a single date when this calculation is performed. Knowing that, I'm just using min. I could use selected value as well. I could use a combination of has one value and min or selected value. In this case, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that there's always going to be one date in context when this calculation is done. I'm getting that date, and then I'm going to say, um, okay, we're only interested in the number of orders that are out, so I'm going to count the rows in the online orders table. Um, I'm going to throw out all of the filtering that's going on because I always want to see the count of all of my orders, regardless of any other slicers or filters, so I use the all function to do that. 
And then I just do some comparison logic here saying where the order date is less than or equal to that date, again on the x-axis, and the delivery date is greater than that selected effective date. So it really is that simple. And like most things in DAX and data modeling, you can spend a lot of time working through and troubleshooting these things, and the answer is usually pretty simple after you figure it out. All right, so that that is how we use disconnected tables along with the uh, switch statement. I'm trying to jump back to PowerPoint here. There we go. Direct query and composite models. Now, this is a deep topic, and let me just um, kind of introduce the problem space before we talk about this, direct query. If you don't have a background in analysis services or tabular modeling, um, let's say that you have a background with SQL Server or another relational database product, chances are very good if you have deep SQL skills, and already understand relational database concepts, you come to a product like Power BI or analysis services, and then learn that there's this option called direct query, which effectively allows you to not, not import data into a data model and then define relationships, but just use your existing data model that exists in your relational database product. Kind of the natural reaction there is, oh my gosh, I don't need to learn DAX, I don't need to do data modeling in Power BI, I can just use my data warehouse or my data mart and then build reports on top of it. And yes, you can, but if you do that, there are a lot of DAX functions that are either going to not perform well or may not work simply because we're not utilizing the in-memory tabular modeling technology that Power BI is based on top of. Now, direct query has its place in the world. And generally, it's so that we can create composite models. So if you have detailed transactional tables that we're not going to do a lot of aggregation over the top of, you can reference those tables using direct query, meaning you're not importing and storing a cached copy of that data, but then for the other tables, you do bring those into the tabular model. They sit in memory, they get compressed, they have relationships defined, and then you can do your grouping, filtering, slicing, and get all of that very fast interactivity because that data is sitting in memory. So um, I'm going to actually show you this data model. I'm just going to show it to you quickly because it's not a topic that we we can really get into the weeds with, but know that this is an advanced capability that allows us to get kind of the best of both worlds. One, we have imported data sitting in memory, as I just described, all of the goodness that comes with that. Yes, you need to learn a little DAX. Yes, you need to understand da data modeling within Power BI or analysis services. Um, but let's say that we've got a transaction table with billions of rows. I don't want to bring that into memory, use up all of that memory on my server in the Power BI service. We can allow a user to drill through to related details by using direct query. That's what a composite model is all about. So let me just show you a, uh, a quick example of a composite model. Again, this one's very simple. It's just really kind of for demo purposes. But here you can see that I, I've brought in the same table in this scenario. In production, typically, your direct query table would be um, more details. But if we look at the, the properties for these tables, you can see that every single table in my model was imported using Power Query and then brought into my data model as I normally would use Power BI. But this table, when I connected to it, I chose the option. There's just a little radio button there, import or direct query. I chose direct query, which means that this, this table does not get materialized into my model. That data is not stored in the model. It remains in SQL Server, and I have a connection to SQL Server. Now, when I deploy this model up into the Power BI service, into the cloud, I need to have a gateway set up so that with a user browses to that table, if I have visuals that are based on that table, that um, it can 
translate the DAX query from the visuals into T-SQL, and that gets processed down on my server, and then the data flows through the gateway, and then I see the results. So in a nutshell, that uh, is how composite models could be created with direct query. There's a lot to that topic that we could get into if we had time. All right, let's get back here. So um, I, I had a, um, a bullet point earlier. In fact, I'm gonna go back to this slide. Who needs relationships anyway? I wanna make the point that relationships serve an important purpose, but they are not an imperative. Many times when you're modeling your data, as things get more complex, you may find that you just can't pound that, that, that table into your, your uh, dimensional model and enforce relationships on it. There are a variety of, of reasons that, that the relationships can get in the way. And I just wanted to show you an example of a model that makes this point. Okay. So I'll just point out that we've got a whole bunch of visuals on this page and I can change my date range slicer and you'll see, I don't need this panel. You can see that the data interacts. You can see that I, I get the, the cross highlighting and cross filtering that I'm used to seeing within Power BI. All of this is working as it should. And so you might think, oh, well, you know, obviously here I, I have product category information, subcategory information, I have dates. There must be a fact table that's related to a date table. There must be a fact table related to the product table, related to geography. But I just wanted to show you that um, with one exception, there are no relationships in this model. Now I'm doing this only to make a point, not because I would, would generally do this in production. It's very possible and actually quite easy in DAX to work without relationships. So in my online sales quantity measure in this model, I've written some simple DAX. So what I'm saying is don't rely on relationships because they don't exist in this model. Go calculate the sum of online, of online sales quantity and go get the customers from the customer table that are in context. In other words, if the customer table has been filtered, go get that set of keys from the customer table and use the treat as function to cast that set of customer keys onto the online sales table. And so treat as allows me to say, just hop from one table to another without worrying about the relationships. This gives us a tremendous amount of power to be able to work without relationships. All right, I see a whole bunch of questions. Um, All right, and I'm going to come back to them because we're uh, we're wrapping up and we've just got six minutes left. Let me go ahead and go to my resource slide. I'm going to jump ahead. So um, this uh, slide deck will be uh, available um, through the presentation. Crystal, are are you there? Uh, we had a question about um, both where to find the recording and um, resources. Um, I will make this available through my personal blog, just so I can give you an answer right now. And uh, Crystal, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, the recording will be available tomorrow around noon. So you guys should receive the email link in your email box with the recording. So you guys will be able to view it. And all of our webinars are on our YouTube page as well under free training. So feel free to okay. listen to that. Can we share the slide deck um, file as well? Uh, we don't share the slide deck file. 
Um, but you guys will have the slide deck in the um, recording. In the recording. Okay. So, um, because I didn't know the answer to this question, this is why I left the full URL in these links. And so uh, you'll have to exercise your typing fingers a little bit. Um, but uh, uh, most of these resources uh, are, are easy to find um, on the web. I, again, um, uh, look to the Pragmatic Works site where we have um, our Azure Everyday videos. So every day we actually share uh, a short uh, two to five minutes of, of insights on related topics. I've done a number of those um, on topics related to data modeling. Um, of course, these recordings and other related recordings. And then I will share the deck um, and uh, a copy of the Power BI file that I've been using through my personal blog. And uh, again, you can find that on the opening slide. So um, with that, we have a few minutes left. So let's go ahead and review our questions before we wrap up. So I'm going to scan the list here. Um, Crystal, if there are specific questions that uh, you can help me call out, feel free to do that. We've got a whole bunch of questions here. So. Uh, um, uh, Richa, I, I, I appreciate the, uh, uh, the resources there about using relationship and, and some of the other techniques. Uh, a lot of content there that I can't necessarily read through right now. For Power BI use, can I just use the star schema in SQL Server instead of analysis services? So Ricardo, I believe the answer to that question is, do I, do I use direct query just to use the existing relationships in star schema in my data model? Yes, you can, but if you use import mode, you're going to get better performance. You're going to uh, be able to build more complex um, and perhaps more insightful uh, measures using DAX if, if those are requirements. I would default to using import mode to bring that into the tabular model inside of Power BI. You had mentioned analysis services, and I, I, I think that means using the tabular model in Power BI. You certainly don't need to use SQL Server analysis services outside of Power BI. It's just the same modeling technology that's baked into Power BI. Um, does Power BI handle slowly changing dimensions? Yes, we can model um, uh, to support slowly changing dimensions. Uh, very quickly, the, 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 the question there is, do I use a parameter to, to capture and snapshot the state of a dimension at a point in time and then bring that data into the model, which means that the, 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 the changing dimensional is frozen in the model, or do I bring in all of my SCD records? Let's say it's an SCD type two where I, I use an effective date. Do I bring all of that into my, um, my uh, fact table? And then do I use a date to slice that effective date? I could do it either way. And if you need to use the latter, you certainly can. It's a technique, it's not a feature. And uh, that's something we would need to dig into quite a bit to, to get into. Um, so I'll say yes. Will you show a data model that's bad? No, I only showed you good ones. I'm sorry, we don't have time uh, to, to um, dig into that uh, a little more. But um, if you could repeat the qualifier for making the decision when to use the composite model. Um, JM, I'm, I'm going to say that the composite model is something that you're typically going to evolve a solution into. It's generally uh, not something that I uh, do up front because the composite model gives us the ability to drill to details. We can typically add those details later on. Now, I, I'm, I'm a, a firm believer in two different concepts. One, plan ahead and understand your requirements. And two, that that's not always reality. Um, and we need to bite off enough that we can chew um, and then work in iterations to evolve a solution. The problem with that is that oftentimes we don't meet all of our requirements when building the foundational solution. So through those iterations, oftentimes we end up kind of throwing some things away and starting over again. And then we, we, we kind of hone and build the right solution. So composite models are not used that often, quite honestly. 
um, but it's something that we typically evolve into. Um, Uh, the URI for my blog is on the first slide. It's it's sqlserverbi.blog. The advantage of productionalizing a Power BI model as opposed to SSAS. Um, um, uh, Sachin, that is an excellent question. Uh, we're a little over time, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna answer it. Microsoft is moving in the direction of making Power BI the product that you will use for everything. Now, there are lots of reasons that, that that's complicated right now. Um, my direction is that I generally use Power BI even for enterprise scale models unless I have a good reason to use SQL Server Analysis Service. Now, now that might be that I have enterprise scale um, requirements that require low level partitioning and a lot of control over partitioning. Now I'm working with a couple of clients right now where we're using either incremental refresh, uh, which is now a, a Power BI Pro license feature. In the past it was premium only. Um, or we're actually using the XMLA endpoint to migrate an SSAS database into a Power BI model and then we can actually create partitions. New feature in preview, um, you know, not in general availability. Well, it is general availability, but it's preview. So we're moving in the direction of using Power BI for the enterprise. But because analysis services has been around for a very long time, um, it, it, it still is kind of the go-to technology for large enterprise scale solutions. You know, stay tuned because that's changing very quickly. All right, well, I think we're out of time. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you ask questions that I wasn't able to get to, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I'm in the middle of a lot of projects right now, very busy, so I can't promise to get back to you right away. Through my blog or through Twitter, you're, you're welcome to reach out to me and I'll get back to you um, as time allows. With that, I thank you very much for your time and for attending and uh, uh, stay safe. Uh, right now, stay socially distanced and isolated, but we do appreciate your attendance. Have a great day. All right. Thank you, Paul. And like I stated before, our webinar, you guys will receive this webinar tomorrow in your inbox around maybe noon or one Eastern Standard Time. Um, so please look out for that. Um, as well, as you guys have any questions for Paul or myself, please feel free to shoot us an email. We'll be happy to help out. We hope you guys enjoyed the webinar. I hope you guys have a good rest of your Tuesday. And like I also stated, all of our webinars are on our YouTube channel. Just go under under Pragmatic Works and go under free training and you'll see all of our past and current webinars. Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Crystal. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.